Good. Good morning to you all. This is our second uh, uh, class on BMPs. And now we're going to go from the field to, well, to the classroom and, or to what we call our laboratory or our construction sandbox. This is a place here at WGR where we uh, play with BMPs. We try different things. We um, test in our sandbox. Well, we use our sandbox for lots of reasons. One is education, like today. Uh, when we don't have a COVID situation, what we love doing is having people like you come out to our sandbox for what we call our BMP roundup. And some of you, I, I know, have attended that in the past. And we'll actually have you install the BMPs. And we'll have you kicking them and testing them out. And so we found that's very, very useful uh, to learn how BMPs are installed and their limitations of them. Uh, but the other thing we use that sandbox for is testing. Uh, we test uh, either new products or we'll test um, uh, uh, different co configurations of pro products. We have a, a test slope that will uh, install different configurations of linear sediment controls. We'll uh, apply different erosion controls down um, and we'll even test things like durability. So we'll leave some BMPs in place way past their normal effective uh, range just to test durability and what happens to them uh, after they've been there too long. So uh, in our BMP sandbox, you'll see today various configurations of BMPs um, and it's always changing out there. So uh, uh, You'll see some that are in good shape, and you'll see some that are obviously not in good shape. And sometimes that's a, a learning thing, and other times it's just a try things out. So, uh, Mike, uh, we're going to be talking about different <coughs> things as we did the last session, but let's start with erosion control. Uh, before we go to the sandbox, why don't you talk to the folks about what is an effective soil cover? What is that at a, at a job site? Well, basically erosion control, you know, typically, especially when a uh, job site has started, is it going to be a temporary BMP. But um, controls can be a number of things. They can be, you know, bark. They can be rock. They can be what we call BFM, which is bonded fiber matrix, which is kind of like paper mache. It's the hydromulch with no seed in it. It can be straw, it can be plastic, it can be a number of things. We've got one area in the back that you'll see in the video that is uh, pine duff. Um, anything to basically stop the rain from directly hitting the soil, which causes erosion immediately. Anything that either redirects it or deflects it or anything like that is uh, an erosion control. So that's what we call erosion controls. Right, right. And uh, if you've been to one of my QSP, QSD classes, I show that corny movie, uh, Junior Raindrop. And mm -hmm. so we talk about Junior a lot around here. We don't want Junior coming in contact with the, with the dirt surface. And so the permit talks, the construction general permit talks about establishing an effective soil cover. Now, the nice thing is it doesn't tell us what exactly we have to use. And as Mike mentioned, we can get creative. We can get very creative. So let's uh, let's show this first video clip, and then we'll talk about um, uh, some some other things about that. So let me uh, uh, share that with you. Again, feel free to chat with us. We want to hear your comments. This is also going to be an interactive class, like the last one. So I'm going to bring up uh, my screen here, and we'll take a look at this. I'll do it with my phone? No, go okay. ahead. Hi, I'm Mike with WGR. And so um, this week, of course, we're talking, you know, SWA week is all about, uh, for me, BMPs and what's effective, what's not effective, what works and what doesn't work. And so what we've done is we've kind of created this construction yard to be able to uh, point out different options and opportunities you have. And then what's cost effective and what's not cost effective. So the first thing I want to talk about is erosion control. So erosion control, Temporary erosion control can be several things. For instance, we've got pine duff here, which is just from our pine trees out front that we covered. And it doesn't make any difference 
what you cover it with just as long as it's covered so that the raindrops don't hit the soil because that's the start of erosion. So you want to probably spread it out, uh, you know, a couple inches thick is pretty much the standard uh, because that's about the most effective we've seen. If it's too thin, then soil seems to go underneath it. So another product that you can use that's pretty cost effective, I mean, this basically was just labor for us to pick up and bring back here in wheelbarrows. This bark, we went over to Home Depot and we bought, cost us $40 for 10 bags. And so we just spread it out. I think this is about six bags. It took us about maybe 10 to 15 minutes. So that's pretty economical. This also can be used as a permanent BMP. So uh, the water board accepts this and they accept mulch um, as a couple of the, the permanent BMPs. Another one is straw. Straw is probably the best bang for your buck because it's the least expensive. It's probably about six to $12 a bale, depending on where you get it. A lot of times what we've seen, and we, we don't have it here this year, but we would buy oat straw in the past and it kind of, you know, starts to grow oats as the weather gets to it. But this is definitely a temporary BMP. Uh, this next is crushed rock. Well, crushed rock can be a permanent BMP as well as a temporary BMP. We don't have it anywhere near as thick as you should have it. Um, the crushed rock should be probably one to two inches thick. And they definitely think that this is a permanent BMP or, or a temporary. You can do it as a temporary cover if you're gonna, for instance, if you're building homes and you wanna scrape it off later to, to be able to put up your homes. But those are some options. You can also use plastic. The drawback to plastic is that it is definitely a temporary BMP, but after, you know, three, four, five months in, in the summertime with the UV rays, it just deteriorates and makes more of a mess and is really not worth it. Now, some of the permanent BMPs that you want for erosion control would be like a uh, bonded fiber matrix with seed in it. So hydro seed, hydro mulch people call it, but it has seed added. Um, it could be mulch, the actual ground up, shredded up uh, trees that, you know, a lot of times I know up in Sacramento, you can get the bark for free. You just drive down there and PG&E and rips it all up in their yard and they give it to you for nothing, or at least that's what they used to do. So uh, you can use hydro mulch, you can use rock, you can use bark, you can use mulch. Those are permanent BMPs. And of course, grass or something like that uh, is a permanent BMP as well. Well, so that kind of covers um, what you can use for temporary or permanent BMPs. So uh, that kind of wraps up our erosion controls. All right, good. And I wanted to show one more um, <laughs> screen here. Uh, let's see, right here. Let me bring this up. Normally in our uh, construction sandbox, we do have uh, um, uh, sprayed on products too. But because of this year and the COVID and not having actual any classes, uh, we didn't have uh, Mark's Hydra Seeding come out and uh, give us uh, the demonstration they usually do each year. So typically we can show you some of this, but we'll show you some pictures from a real site. Of course, Mike, you remember what site this is. Yeah, um, absolutely. <laughs> so this is a, a, a hydraulic mulch is a generic name of it. Uh, there's uh, literally dozens of different variations of, of this, different manufacturers, uh, but it's a sprayed on product. And uh, uh, sometimes people will call this hydro seeding. Actually, uh, it would not be hydro seeding until seed is added to this very same thing. So it's the same process. Um, a lot of folks don't understand uh, the difference between hydraulic mulch and hyd hydro seeding. Hydraulic mulch is really the carrier. It's really what keeps the soil uh, bonded and keeps it uh, junior raindrop from coming into contact with that soil until uh, germination is established. And then uh, the seed, if, it's, if, if it has been mixed in here, well then uh, as soon as it gets water, either through irrigation or through the fall and, and w initial winter rains, uh, starts to germinate and grow. And then the, uh, the new plants then provide the effective soil cover uh, rather than the hydraulic mulch. Now, uh, when we just use the hydraulic mulch, Mike was talking about permanent and temporary uh, uh, effective soil covers or, or BMPs. The hydraulic mulch would be a temporary BMP. You cannot get an, a notice of termination accepted with a photo that looks like this. 
you can you can try, but they will they'll they'll uh, reject it. Even this, I mean, this is beautiful. This is a beautiful application, uh, but it would not get you an NOT yet because the water board would consider this as a temporary stabilization method. What they want to see is permanent. Even if this contains seed, which it did in this picture, it did contain seed, but but obviously it hadn't start germinating yet. So we would have to wait. Uh, I think this was actually taken almost exactly a year ago now. Uh, we would have to wait until we started to get those first initial fall rains and hopefully uh, the germination starts um, taking off pretty quickly and maybe two, three weeks after some good rains, we might start to see enough germination. Depending on the type of seed we use and how fast it germinates and grows uh, would di dictate when we could actually file for our notice of termination, come out again, and then take some other photographs of this. Um, so Mike, uh, talk to us. Uh, I know you work a lot with Mark's hydroseed and other hydroseeders. Uh, they've told us over the years about application of this product. Um, uh, and we've tried it out in our own sandbox. What can you tell, tell our viewers about uh, hydraulic mulch? One of the things that we found, uh, found out that was kind of fascinating is, is um, Mike came out and sprayed an area and it looked exactly like this, just covered in green. And, and then after he sprayed it, turned off his machine and started talking to us and said, now, does this, how does this look to everyone? And the class pretty much agreed. Yeah, it looks great. This is what we see. And he said, well, I need you to know that um, this application, he said, the QSD will design it for so much of this product per acre. And he said, what do you think, uh, as we were looking uh, on our site, he says, what do you think this coverage would be kind of, would it be adequate? And we're like, sure. And he said, no, it'd be completely inadequate because he said, I'm only spraying from one direction. He said, you typically want to spray from two directions. A real simple thing he said was, when a uh, hydro seed truck comes on site and has say 50 bags of uh, mulch that they're gonna put down, he said that's because they've come out with what the QSD has, has uh, um, you know, designed to go on to be implemented. He said, well, if they leave with half of that cell on the truck, you know that you didn't get a good job. He said, so too often we see completely green cover. We think, oh yeah, that's great, looks great. He said, but just make sure that when they come on site, they use all their product because you're not going to get a really great job unless uh, you know they use it up um, for what the QSD has has uh, you know described. Right. So uh, when you have a site like this, in fact, let me go back to the share so we can see the picture. It's more interesting looking at us, anyways. Let uh, me go yes. back there <laughs> and uh, we'll show we'll show what those pictures look like. So when you have a site like this, uh, one of the important things you would want to do is go up let's see if I can get my arrow back here it is you'd want to go up to the top of that hill and look down to see if it was installed correctly um, and if you see a lot of dirt at the top so if it's been sprayed from the bottom up they will you'll when you're at the bottom of the hill you'll see really good coverage but when you go to the top of the hill you'll still see a lot of exposed dirt and so ideally, the uh, good reputable hydroceders uh, like to um, get it from multiple angles. Now that's not always possible. Sometimes it's just logistically not possible to get it from the top. So then they'll use a, a lopping method where they will shoot it kind of more up into the air and get it to drop down like rain rather than just blasting it onto the hillside. And so they'll kind of lob it onto the hillside. Um, and Mike mentioned too, uh, Mike Lewis mentioned that Mike Mark uh, to told us about counting bags. Uh, again, you know, hopefully you don't have this issue with reputable uh, contractors, but we call out certain specifications. So on a hillside uh, like this, uh, I will typically call out a 3,500 pounds per acre mix of, of hydraulic mulch. If it's a flat area, uh, typically I'll do 1,500 uh, pounds per acre. 
But something like this, I really want to lock it down. I really want to protect my surfaces. Uh, I'm going to go with a much larger mix. And so, yeah, uh, what you want to do as a QSP and as watching out for your, your um, client's interest or the owner's interest is to count the bags to make sure that if they're, if they're installing 3,500 pounds per acre and I have one acre in their 50 pound bags, I need to do the math and make sure they brought enough bags and that uh, there's that many empty bags at the end of the day. Uh, so we need to make sure that they're doing that. Also, when you go with a 3,500 pound mix, it's best um, to do it in two different lifts to go ahead and do an initial lift and, and let that cure a little bit. Hopefully the job site's big enough so they can just you know progress and move along and then come back and get it with another treatment. Uh, if you're using hydro seed uh, or putting seed into that hydraulic uh, mulch mix, usually what I like to see is the seed mixed into the first lift and applied with that, and then have a second lift without seed on top of it, just to protect the seed a little bit and give it a little bit of cover. Um, that's that's how I prefer to see it done. And John, uh, yes, um, I, I tell you, for it was great. It was great for me to actually visually see what I was told in the past. Uh, I've been told in the past that some hydro seeds are. Um, so effective that they can be sprayed on even when it's when the soil conditions are damp. Which, when you first when you first hear that, you think that's not possible because if the soil's wet, it's not going to stick. It's not going to work. But I actually had a site in Santa Rosa that we were having um, some erosion problems, and we were really getting close to the place of of uh, you know having some discharges. And I had the hydro seed company come out, and they sprayed a product on. That basically, and, and there was water flowing down this slope, and it basically stopped it. It was just like a glove. It went over and stopped it. I, I wouldn't have believed it until I saw it. So just FYI, if you're ever getting a situation where you've got a site that's really, um, you know, a freak rainstorm comes in and really is, is uh, pummeling your site, there is products out there. They're, they're pricey, but it's much more effective than having uh, sediment head down a storm drain with NAL exceedances. So, in fact, I want to show this picture again. I keep coming back to this, but can anybody tell me what is missing on this hillside? At least what is missing sometimes, and then I'll then I'll like probably I'll explain to you why it's not there. But can anybody tell me what is missing here? Let me. Uh, in fact, I need to see my chat. Sorry about that there we go all right T type in if you know what what's missing on that hillside yeah sediment controls we call them linear sediment control breaks um so uh they're not there and maybe they should be there yeah good you got it you got it uh and brian hoffman yes they could be compost socks <laughs> we wouldn't expect anything else from brian from brian yes. yes yes but we'll just leave it generically the linear sediment controls be it compost socks or fiber roll or um it could be other things i've seen gravel bags used occasionally but generally it's one of those yeah they're they're missing now um now that i got you awake can anybody tell me why they might legitimately, legitimately be missing? I was just going to tell you on my own, but I got a sharp class here. Let's tell me why they might legitimately be missing. There's a couple of reasons. The grade of the slope. Uh, no, not, not necessarily. If it was a flat side, I'd give that to you uh, to add to hydraulic mulch. Uh, CGP word effective. Uh, well, we're, you're you're on. You're not not quite there. Uh, the hyd the add to hydraulic mulch. Uh, actually, we would not want to add the linear control breaks after the hydraulic mulch uh, because we would mess that up. An installation uh, crew getting up there to install the linear control breaks. And remember, they need to be keyed in. If we're using fiber roll. 
they need to be keyed in. Even if we're using uh, Brian's uh, compost socks, on a hillside like this, they need to be staked down and we're gonna be dragging them up there and we got crews and we would not want to do that. Uh, anybody know? To allow for the growth of the vegetation. If the five rolls are present, you would uh, see breaks in the vegetation growth. You're getting warm, James, you're getting very warm. Uh, that's, that's along the right path. The reason here for this one is because this was final site stabilization we were going for final site stabilization, and we needed to not have any temporary BMPs in place in order to get our NOTs. So what we were doing is this one had uh, seed applied to it. Uh, we're waiting now for the, the fall rains to uh, happen and have it grow up. So we would not have to go back into this vegetated area and pull those, rip those, uh, fiber rolls out and thereby cause more damage to the slope. So that was why. There's also mm -hmm. another legitimate reason why it might not be present or at least required to be present is if this was a risk one site, risk level one site, linear sediment controls on the hillside are not required under attachment C of the CGP. Now that's not to say that they're not important and might not be beneficial because they, they may be very beneficial, especially during active construction activities when we're not going for final site stabilization. Uh, but uh, those are two legitimate reasons. All right, I'll stop that share and we'll move on to our sandbox. Typically we'll show you something like this in our sandbox. And if you get a chance to come out to one of our BMP roundups in the future, we'll actually have a applicator out there spraying it so that you can see it and have them talk to you directly. But unfortunately, we didn't have a, a live example right now of that. All right, let's move on, Mike, to, um, let's, we did a pretty good job of talking about sediment control, but let's take another look at sediment control here at the sandbox and uh, maybe talk a little bit about this more. I don't know if we have new people on here that wasn't here the last hour. So I'm going to share my screen. And uh, Mike, while I'm getting that up, talk to the folks about sediment control and the different types of sediment control we try to show at our, in our sandbox. Well, a couple of really good sediment controls, of course, you know, most people know about them. They're silt fence and fiber roll. And then of course you also have, um, you know, filter socks, which are highly effective. We've had great results with them. Uh, usually the pushback on recommending silt fence, like a QSD a lot of times will call out for silt fence in a place. I'll get some pushback from the contractor. Well, we don't wanna install silt fence, it's, it's too costly. Well, I just did a little bit of research before we started this to find out um, comparable pricing. So I went to Whitecaps website and it said that 25 feet of fiber roll was $48 and 100 feet of silt fence was $32. So as you can see, both of them need to be keyed in correctly. So if they are keyed in, uh, the best bang for your buck is definitely gonna be silt fence and it's gonna be better because it's got uh, more volume. So uh, you know, you've got usually 18 inches to three feet of silt fence versus five inches of fiber roll if it's keyed in correctly. So there's that. We have really seen um, filter sock works great because it actually stops sediment and allows water to go on through. And as we all know, you don't want water to be left on site. The builder can't build in a swimming pool. So uh, we've seen great results from filter socks. Yeah. Um, they're really quite effective. Well, let's take a look at this video and then we'll talk a little bit more about it. And now we've moved over to sediment controls. And sediment controls are kind of the second uh, plate thing in your BMP toolbox. Erosion control is first. You want to stop the erosion so that these sediment controls can be quite effective. Um, if not, if you don't have any erosion controls and it's just sediment controls, they're probably going to be overwhelmed. So you look at this fiber roll. This fiber roll is used as a sediment control. It's supposed to be staked in every four foot, but it's supposed to be keyed in. And as you can see, this stuff isn't keyed in. So it should be keyed in and it should uh, be staked every four feet, and that's a nice sediment control. And then here's another sediment control, silt fence. 
We see this a lot on the construction site. And so silt fence, as you can see, this is keyed in. So you want to always check silt fence, come up to it and kind of put your foot against it and kind of see as long as, and make sure that everything's kicked in. If it's not, if it's not keyed in and it's above ground, of course, it's not going to be effective. Now, ultimately, why do you want to use one over the other? Most people use fiber roll because they think it's inexpensive. It's exactly the same amount of labor to install fiber roll as it is to install silt fence if you key it in. So fiber roll, for instance, over at Home Depot is about $42 for 25 feet. Silt fence, on the other hand, is $32 for 100 feet. So the reason you want to use it sometimes is because it's, it's uh, a better bang for your buck. But ultimately, when you look at it, I mean, when you look at fiber roll, you've got an eight inch roll. And so the maximum amount of sediment that you're probably going to get, even if it's, if it's not keyed in, but if it's keyed in is about five inches. And with this, this is, this is three feet. So you're going to get three feet of coverage, or I've seen it from 18 inches to three feet. So you're going to get that much, that much sediment can build up before it comes over, if it goes over the top. So this is a better uh, cost effective measure because it's going to take you the same amount of labor to put it in. Now, um, let's shift to perimeter controls. Can silt fence and fiber roll be used as uh, perimeter control? Absolutely. Either one of them. So we see a lot of times they'll put silt fence up around the perimeter and um, it won't necessarily be there for a sediment control. They'll use it as, well, they'll call it a construction boundary, but we tell them it's a sediment control. So it can be used as both the perimeter control and the sediment control. Now, a good question we get asked all the time, well, as I have that orange fencing that, you know, basically is around my construction site, the footprint that I have, can't I use that as perimeter control? The answer is no. And the reason is because a perimeter control needs to be effective in keeping sediment and soil and, and um, turbid water from going off site. So ESA fencing, as we all know, won't do that. All right. So next. All right, so I, we are getting a little bit redundant in, in what we've been saying in this class and last class, but then, you know, it bears repeating. Uh, but let's uh, back this up and take a look at this. Now, again, our construction sandbox, we test durability. Mike, how long has silt fence been out there? It's been installed for quite some time. It's gotta be there for at least, it's, it's over two years, I know. It's been there that okay. long. And, and we do this intentionally. So, you know, to help you judge how long your BMPs can be in place and be effective, I would say that this silt fence is pretty much seen its lifetime. You can, uh, in fact, almost see through it. Not to say that this silt fence doesn't, still won't have some effectiveness in it, but it's, it's losing its integrity. In fact, it's amazing that it's still on the stakes. Um, lots of times we'll see that come down first. I don't know if Mike went out there and stapled it back up before the class or not, but uh, uh, usually it'll come off the stakes due to wind or or just you know just exposure. Uh, but uh, you can tell now that this silt fence has seen its lifespan and needs to be replaced. Still keyed in, that's good. Still staked up and and attached, that's good. But we're probably needing to change it out. Also. This, uh, let's get back to where we had the uh, fiber roll. I think it was right here. Obviously, that is a complete problem, although not untypical of many job sites, right? You probably, many of you have seen stuff just like that. If not even, you know, uh, we call that window dressing BMPs. Not effective at all. So, Mike, when people select BMPs, you know, they tend to go to the cheapest things, but Durability, does that play into what BMPs maybe they should consider? Oh, for sure. Uh, silt fence outlasts fiber roll, as we all know. Plus, um, people aren't as apt to drive over silt fence because it is a visual they can see. As, and when it comes to fiber roll, well, we call it pancake roll uh, after it's been driven over a few times. But yeah, long term, this netting around the fiber roll usually is good for six, seven months and then you need to take it out and replace it. And like I say, you know, you're looking at silt fence that, you know, as John said, is not completely effective because it is thinning, it is letting go. Um, so um, yeah, long-term silt fence is a much better product cost. It's much more cost-effective than fiber roll. Yeah. 
and and just comparing these two that we see in this picture, we'll talk about a third here in a second. But uh, I, before we leave the uh, fiber roll, uh, that fiber roll is probably mm -hmm. about a year old, and it's been moved probably three four times. Uh, and you can tell it hasn't fared well. Um, and the concern that the water board has with this and, and other entities like Caltrans, Caltrans won't even allow this product because this is monofilament netting. And that netting's problematic for a couple of reasons. One is uh, it tends to photodegrade and break down and become trash. Uh, so it adds to microplastics and other uh, significant trash problems and exactly the thing we're trying to avoid here in California. The other problem is to wildlife because the the straw, as you see, is starting to get mashed down, just uh, re, you know losing its its tightness, and so uh, it will become a possibility of entrapment for animals that are you know crawling through it, uh, snakes, lizards, rodents, etc. And so uh, for those reasons, uh, definitely want to replace it within its timeline and consider an alternate product. Now, an alternate product, and we got our good friend Brian here, I noticed online, is, um, is compost socks. And compost socks, at face value, just to purchase them are a little bit more expensive than these two options, but we're talking about durability. Uh, you need to factor in your durability. How long will that BMP last and am I going to have to replace my my comp or my fiber roll two three times for the lifespan of a like say a compost sock or a gravel bag, uh, something that has a more durable uh, fabric on it? And so uh, we've seen compost socks last well almost as long as that silk fences last out there, which would be three to four times the average duration of of um, fiber roll. And John, one of the things that is a real plus about uh, filter sock is that when the project is finished, we just finished a project up in Antelope. When the project was finished, the, the contractor said to me, now what do I do with all this, this uh, filter sock? I have to haul it all off? I said, no, take a utility knife, cut the fabric off and dump it. It's got mulch inside. That's a permanent BMP. So it was a win-win for him. He, yeah. He thought that was really... Uh, a, a great asset because he said typically he has to take these temporary BMPs and throw them in a dumpster. Yeah. So another thing that, yeah, exactly, Mike. Uh, another thing that we'll see is uh, misunderstandings about how to install these and how to use these. Uh, a lot of people think, well, if one is good, then two is even better. Uh, but in that comes a, a fundamental misunderstanding of what these devices are doing. So, Mike, Either of these devices, now I'm assuming that we have good, you know, neither of these are in good shape right now. But assuming they were in new, brand new shape, properly installed, do either of these uh, um, filter? No, neither one of them filter. Yeah, right. They're basically damned. So, so how is that sediment control? How's, how's that work? <clears throat> well, the sediment control is the fact that it basically stops the sediment from going past it and the water uh, until it, it reaches the top and then it breaches over. The silt fence, of course, is, is a, a better product because you have more, more sediment that you can capture. But neither one are a filtration device. And so that's what effectively we want at the end of the day is for this water to go off the site. So there needs to be another BMP, you know, after these yeah. two that uh, originally catch, catch the sediment. So they're just basically stopping the flow. They're like mini dams. And so what I've seen is I've seen numerous sites put the fiber roll right in front of that silt fence mm. and double it up and thinking, hey, if one's better, two, or if one's good, two's better. Well, no, you're, you're misunderstanding it because uh, a silt fence and a fiber roll really doesn't slow the flow down a whole lot more than just the silt fence or the fiber roll by itself. All right, good. Um, let me um, unshare here and how's our chat? Let me um, get, get back to our chat. Any questions or comments? All right, uh, yeah, we've had a few. Um, all right. 
actually those were from the earlier one. All right. Yeah, if you have any questions, go ahead and, and type it in. All right, let's go to our next video um, and take a look at uh, another BMP that we have on our site. So let me uh, share this. All right. Uh, Let's go to talk about um, track out control a little bit here. So um, let's take a look at this demonstration that we do. Okay, we talked about track out yesterday and I quickly kind of covered the fact of uh, what we built here. This, I measured it this morning, this is 42 feet long, 10 feet wide, 12 inches deep with fabric in it. The rattle trap is in the middle. But we wanted to kind of show you and point out the fact that even though this looks good, it's only eight feet short of what Casca would say would be normal or normal for a job site would be whatever you could get away with uh, as far as uh, uh, how much room you have. I wanted to show you, um, so we parked a van back here. We got the a little mud around. We're going to get the tires one revolution. We're going to come out and I'm going to kind of show you what it looks like um, just with one vehicle leaving so that you can get an idea of, of what needs to happen, even though this looks like a really sufficient track out. you can tell this is some sediment still leaving and so you can see some trails on it. So what we're basically saying is if in this instance we have a TC2 which we can take traffic all the way around to the front of the building but if we didn't if we were having to leave this gate more than likely with one truck with one revolution of tires and a little mud basically track out would be in the street so you almost always need to have an extra BMP which would be a sweeping program because without a sweeping program, you're gonna be out in the street, uh, hand sweeping it, trying to fight this. And then you can see just the amount of sediment that has dropped off the little bit that we came through, which was you know, not a muddy site, just a mud uh, and a little space. So you can see what was already on the controls. And so this just kind of really shows you that you need to, this BMP, a lot, a lot of times we think one BMP is sufficient. This just goes to show you that one PM, BMP is not sufficient. You need a sweeping program of some sort. Okay. okay. So isn't that depressing, everybody? I mean, you spend, uh, what, $3,000 to $5,000 uh, to build a, a track out control device that is even, you know, to spec. It's, it's TC1. In fact, notice here that you see the sediment trap right here for uh, washing, uh, uh, maintaining this, or even doing a wheel wash. So it all drains to where this grizzly's at, and then the, then uh, it drains into the sediment trap, and we even have a sump pump in here to pump it back, this water that's collected back to a, a permeable area of the project. Uh, and one vehicle, and only the back tires, through a mud puddle. I mean, look at this mud puddle. It's not much of a mud puddle. And what did we see? I mean, let's take a look. Look at that sediment, one vehicle. So if you were with us in the last wor workshop and we saw uh, a track out not too different from this one, um, with truck after truck after truck leaving the site, did it even have a chance? I, I mean, this is, this, for us, this was hugely eye-opening, huh, Mike? Did I lose you? Yeah, completely amazing, John. We would have, I would have assumed that the, we went to the trouble to make it 
as much uh, to the TC1 specs as possible. And I would have guessed, oh, this is no problem. Going over the rattle trap, the big four to six rock, four to six inch rock, all the sediment's just gonna fall off and there's gonna be nothing, no residue. But we were sadly mistaken. Yeah, yeah. So um, what this really opened our eyes to is the importance of a sweeping program. Uh, and, and again, just look, I mean, let me share this. I was just checking to see if I had any chats, uh, but you, you look at look at the amount of sed sediment that one trip left on the surface. And you, it, it's not just staining, there is some staining, but if you look in here, you see actual particles that were left onto that. And that, that track out, uh, should have been more than adequate to take care of that. And it was in relatively good shape. Uh, so very, very eye-opening. And uh, you, you gotta do more to control your track out than just uh, build a track out control device that even looks good and is to spec. All right, any comments? Good. All right, Mike, uh, let's... Uh, Let's now move to uh, another segment and let's talk a little bit about, let me check on our time here. Let's, let's talk about housekeeping for a moment. So I'm gonna show this video next. Let me share that screen. Here we go, we're gonna talk about housekeeping. You don't have that large of a footprint. So now we're gonna change over to some housekeeping things. So one of the things in housekeeping is, is washout. Washout is pretty much a constant uh, nemesis on our jobs. On almost everything we go on, track out is an issue. So basically track out is an issue and then washout is an issue. So washout, you can have this kind of a container. So we got this this uh, 20 yard container that you know you can put your, the concrete truck can back up on and he can dump his slurry into here. Here's the issue with this. A lot of times there will be spills or a lot of times this will get to capacity and then you have to have a company come out and dewater it and then have to have it hauled off. So even though this looks like it'd be a very practical thing, which it is because it holds more volume, on residential track homes what we have found is the best bang for their buck is to get a kiddie pool. They get a kiddie pool which is $10, $15, fill it full of the slurry, it dries hard. Once it dries hard they just throw it in the dumpster and they're done with it. So that's pretty good. Now, here's another issue that we always run into is secondary containment. So as you can see, there's these, these buckets sitting out. So if it starts to rain, who knows what's in these buckets? And who knows what the rain is gonna do? It's gonna probably overflow some of these buckets and they're gonna spill out. Is it okay to spill out on soil? Absolutely not. This needs to be in a secondary containment. It needs to be a plastic down with berm so that, so that it can be contained. Um, so that you, you can basically see what, you, what, uh, what goes on. If we don't have this, we're guaranteed to get a spill. If we get a spill, guess what we're sampling for? Non-visible pollutants. That's a big to-do because that means we have got to go to the lab. That means we've got to get sample tubes. So that's the last thing you want, that's for sure. Okay, let's see. We could also talk about trash. So trash containers, this particular one we've chosen to basically put here because it's all contained. So storm water can't get to it, can't affect it, no matter what. But a lot of times it's just a dumpster on site. And if it's a dumpster on site, you need to have it covered by the end of each and every workday. Now, is that practical and do we see it done? Not often, but you definitely need to have a way to cover it prior to a rain event because they all leak. They leak like a sieve. All right, Mike, let's uh, talk about, let's go back to the uh, concrete washout. Mike, you see different, um, ways it's done. You had mentioned the uh, kiddie pools. Of course, uh, Caltrans would not allow kiddie pools. You have to have uh, approved devices uh, for that. Uh, although uh, I think for smaller uh, independent projects, I've seen kiddie pools for work very effectively for smaller quantities. Uh, but how else have we seen people deal with concrete washout? Well, a lot of times, um, in fact, I've seen several projects where they will take Oh, 20 by 20 area. They'll put hay bales around it. They'll wrap plastic over the hay bales and they will, you know, make that their concrete washout. 
So the problem with that I've seen um, when they, they're first installed, they look great and they work great. Problem with that is over time is the degradation of uh, the plastic and concrete truck backs into the hay bale, crushes the hay bale, and there's leaks from it. Right. So um, yeah, it's just containment. So if they have a way, I, I don't really care what they use. Um, if they have a way to contain the washout till it dries and they can dispose of it, then that's great. Uh, I've seen those, uh, we've probably seen them, they're about a five by five plastic um, container that is that has metal frame around it. I've seen those used where they cut the lid off and they'll use that as a washout. I've seen all kinds of things. Right. Uh, on small construction sites, the kiddie pool is really effective, like you say, um, but um, it's, it's mostly just containment. And, and one of the things that we see um, often is, uh, um, in fact, I, I think I got some chats here. I want to make sure I'm, I'm capturing those. Okay, um, let me grab our chats. Okay, where are they to go? All right, but uh, let me stop share just so I can see the chats. Uh, one of the things that we see often used is um, self-recycling trucks. Uh, and you probably have seen these if you've been out on construction sites at all, is that many uh, delivery trucks now come equipped with a bucket that they can put at the end of their chute. And at the bottom of the bucket is a vacuum hose that goes up into, uh, basically it will take uh, what's in the bucket back into their, their drum, into the spinning drum. And the idea is that they can wash down this chute, it goes into the bucket, it's pumped back into the drum, and then all of that wash water then goes back to the ready mix plant where it is recycled. Um, that is actually a, um, that is actually uh, in theory a good idea, but believe me, I have seen uh, it fail miserably so many times, mostly because of probably lack of, of oversight or supervision and uh, maybe a lack of understanding of what we're trying to accomplish. In fact, I won't show it today. I show it in some of my QSP, QSD classes, but I have a video of that operation. And the guy's washing down his chute and he's getting just about as much uh, off the, out of the bucket as he's getting in the bucket. Uh, but uh, just before I shot the, the video, um, I started the video just too late because what he did was he took his bucket and disconnected it and dumped it on the ground. You know, I think he was missing the point. And the, one of the reasons I don't show the video is because you can prominently see displayed on the truck the, who, what company that is. Uh, but uh, I think he's missing the point there. And as Mike mentioned, that would definitely, definitely trigger uh, non-visible pollutant sampling. Uh, and it's just not understanding what needs to happen. All right, good, I got some good comments here. A dig a hole in line with plastic. Yeah, Gail, that's the traditional way. Um, now, I know our regional board is not a fan of that, and, one, and I'm personally not a fan of it either. It can be done effectively, and I still see it in a lot of specs, even municipal specs. I see the old uh, depressed area with the hay bales or, or a berm plastic line. One of the reasons that the water board's not a fan of that is that those systems will sooner or later fail. They will leak. And now we got uh, high pH liquids going into the soil. And so I, I tend to stay away from those, but technically they are allowed in many instances. Um, and then uh, someone said, uh, Caltrans standard T59, very useful, no seams allowed. Yes, yes. So. If you do do that, you don't want to layer your, you know, you don't want it. You don't want any seams. Uh, you want to have it all um, one solid piece of plastic. Um, all right. So let's uh, do one more. I think we got about 10 minutes left, a little under 10 minutes. And what we want to show you is another thing that we've been playing with in our construction sandbox. You know, you get those situations where you're, you're testing your, your discharge points and you get one bad actor, one that is causing your NALs to be exceeded. 
you know, you have to test every discharge point at least once per day, and then you got to have a minimum of three samples uh, per day for the entire site in order to look at your, your uh, numeric action levels for your pH and your turbidity. And so you know what happens. You've got half a dozen sites that are discharging, but one of them is a bad actor. It's causing your turbidity to go over the NAL as you average it out. So what do you do? What do you do, Mike? You just stop sampling? No, hardly. Yeah, shut that off and redirect it, put some BMPs in place, and get it to start acting correctly. Yeah, and Mike, we've been playing around with a, 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 a suite of BMPs. In fact, people can see it behind me in, my, in the screen share that I'm going to do, but why don't we bring up that video and take a look at that. So one more video for you all, and uh, let me uh, get back to uh, that, so bear with me. All right. And uh, let's take a look at our treatment train. Okay, well, this is what we would call an added feature. This isn't typically in our BMP class, but we just wanted to show you something that we had ran across. We had a project down south that uh, had a four-story unit with a parking garage underneath. And they started building the parking garage in the summer, and then when it got to the winter time, they had not closed in the garage fully, and big rainstorm came and filled up the basement with water, you know, a couple inches of water. And they ended up finding out that they had about 80,000 gallons of water that they needed to get rid of. Well, they wanted to discharge it in the storm drain, so we checked it for pH, and the pH was like just below 10. Um, so we said, well, you can't discharge this into the storm drain. You've got to put some kind of treatment. So they said, well, they didn't have any money. They didn't want to spend anything. So what can we do? So we started thinking one of the things that we had been involved in is with these filter socks, we had seen some real sediment dropping with the filter socks. We'd seen some metal dropping and we'd see pH drop just slightly. So we started doing some research and one of the companies that we work with is a composting company. And so they told us that this is just typical compost, but they said the redwood compost uh, lowers pH. So we set up this treatment train on site and we started pumping in and so we had to do some experiments. We set the first media bay, we set with redwood mulch, the second with redwood mulch, and the third with sand. And what we found out is that once the water had started going through both medias of redwood mulch, the pH went below six and a half, which is uh, outside the exceedance. So we had to kind of revamp our, pro our program. So we took one bay out and just put in sand we put in uh, redwood mulch and then we put in sand and then we were right at probably 6.9 to 7.5 right in there we were able to actually discharge 80,000 gallons slowly it took about a week uh, through this whole treatment system and this whole treatment system that we built was about two thousand dollars <clears throat> so if you figure what it's going to cost you to have an active treatment system in place then it's going to be way 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 more than that so what I want to kind of show you also is when we came back, we started thinking, hey, I wonder what this will do to turbidity. So I'm going to show you, we've got our turbidity meter out here, and I also can show you the pH. But what I wanted to show you is I'm going to stir up this turbidity a little bit. We're going to get a sample, and then we're just going to see what happens. And this is real time, so it, uh, it's been here for, this has been here for about a year and a half, so I'm not quite sure how it's going to work, if it's still as effective as it was when we first put it in. But let's find out. <clears throat> so we'll put this in, turn the turbidity meter on, we'll see what happens. And then I'll grab another sample right on the back side <clears throat> after it comes through the compost. And then we'll grab another sample when it finally comes through the compost and goes into the sand. And we'll see what it reads. What is that sample reading? 445. So 445. So we know that the turbidity readings, the limits are basically 250, right? So it's 250, anything below 250. So now let's just take this sample just on the other side of the filter socks and see what it reads. And you can see it's got some bark in it. So we may have a little problem. I might have to redo it, but let's, let's find out. And then once this wicks through, I'll grab a sample on the back side and we can see what that reads. So the only thing that we have here is you're coming through this filter sock, which has got mulch in it as a media. 
So dropping the turbidity, these filter socks are really good at dropping the turbidity. So let's look at what came out. 181. So now we're below NAL, right? So now we're going to come back to this last one and I'm going to take and see how this is kind of red. So it's the tannins that are in the media that are basically making this. So if you would look at this with the naked eye, you would probably think, oh my goodness, that's going to be worse than it was when you started. So let's have a look and see what it does. One of the things that we did as an experiment is we put coffee um, in a little one of our beakers and put it in there just to see what it was and coffee came back at 60. So just because you look at something with the naked eye and you think you know what it's going to be doesn't necessarily mean what it turns out to be. So this was, so it went down to 30.2. So that's pretty amazing. Let's see if we can get the pH. Let's see what the pH is. So we'll check the pH here, see if we can get a, a reading. I'll put the hold button once it kind of settles down. Okay, we got 9.53. Okay, now we're gonna go on the back side of this into the sand area. And we're gonna get another reading, see what that is, okay? All right, let's see what we get here. Let's hit the hold button. So what do you have? 8.04. Okay, so that's pretty amazing. So it was amazing to us, and it sure is. So think about this. If you have one of these sites that has a particular area that is really acting up, maybe instead of uh, your first place you go to for an active treatment system, maybe you try something like this. It's pretty inexpensive. And believe me, the contractor will love you for spending just a couple of thousand dollars versus hundreds of thousands of dollars. Now, all right, we're going to stop it there just because of time. Uh, we only have a couple minutes left, but let me um, unshare this. And uh, all right, so uh, now the um, yeah, coffee with cream would be much higher. I agree. Yes, right. <laughs> yes. <was> okay. <laughs> yes. Um, just a couple comments here. First off, this is in our construction sandbox, so it's just a test one, and we only have so much water that we can justify running through here. Uh, you can see the tote, and even with, with our hose on and all that, it's still not a lot of water. So with more water, we get more movement. We get, uh, um, in, our, in our experience, less tannins. That was pretty dark, uh, probably because it had been sitting there and brewing for a little bit, uh, making iced tea. Uh, uh, so typically what we see is uh, with faster moving water, moving it through this faster, we would have a whole lot less staining and it would look much, much more acceptable than that. I would have a little bit of concern uh, discharging that, although it is under, um, it is under um, NALs, but uh, it's definitely, definitely don't want to be considered a nuisance discharge either. And so there's other considerations to watch out for. So using uh, maybe a fresher media, uh, keeping the water flow going through that faster, uh, we would see it, it uh, work. And we have, we've used this in the field, as Mike says, and have not had the issues with tannins and lignans uh, leaching out in it quite John, a bit. Yes. And what we have seen also is if we made that last media bay sand, the tannins, I mean, it, the water completely changed. It, like Which it, it is. All in the, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. We just didn't show you take the sample after the sand. So yes, right. uh, we have one more. In fact, you were taking it before the sand, uh, but you got to pass all through that sand, go through another a layer of compost socks, and then uh, through a gravel area, and then would be your final discharge point. And you're right. Um, so keep this in mind. Uh, this is a not, a, it won't fix all the problems. A site with clays, colloidal clay suspension, this won't work at all. Uh, those clays will blow right through it. But if you have a bad actor, this is something that you can easily put together for, oh, uh, a couple thousand dollars in materials, and if that, and probably four hours of labor, uh, you can assemble this. And uh, 
and respond to uh, a numeric action level exceedance. Uh, and, and it doesn't take that much room either. So you can either sheet flow into this device using sandbags to kind of direct it into it, or you could uh, pump into it and let it flow through there. Mike, we've also done this on a smaller scale. Instead of hay bales, what do we use? We use fiber roll. Yeah, and wrap it in plastic. We just wrapped it in plastic. We glued the seams together because we didn't have plastic that was, you know, the whole length. Glued it together. It was on dirt, so it was a pretty controlled area, but it worked pretty well. And we found that having the, the double up compost sock, as you, uh, as you can see in the pictures behind us, having uh, two across and two high, too high uh, really helped uh, because what we want to get is all that weight pushing the compost socks down onto the plastic liner so that you get very, very good site conformance. And also having the media causes better distribution. It, it, it helps eliminate paths of preferential flow where it might be sneaking through a crevice or something. And John, also one of the things that we found out to be really effective, if you want to do something like this with a filter sock, is get the filter sock wet once you get it in place because they're self-weighting and they really conform, like John says. Uh, when they're dry, it took us, we, we learned some lessons that uh, when we first started. It, uh, it's much more effective if you can get them wet and get them to seat. Okay, well, we're out of time. I have one last question. What is the name of the inspection app? Uh, there's, you know, there's some good ones out there. Just Google it. Um, we were using for a long time uh, uh, Go Canvas. You might go look them up. Uh, you might even still find our inspection apps on there. Uh, Go Canvas isn't particularly for stormwater. They're just for uh, forms that are used by professionals. Uh, we use them, uh, but there's various ones out there. Uh, we actually, uh, within the last year, created our own. So we did our own programming and we have our own inspection app now, so we don't have to pay a subscription to anybody. Uh, but uh, um, yeah, all right, well, we need to end this because we're past time, but thank you everybody again for joining Stormwater Awareness Week. We got some really good workshops still coming up. You won't wanna miss Fridays. You know, I uh, there's certain people I really respect in this field, David Franklin's one of them, but John McCullough, I consider to be the best erosion control guy around. He's, he's internationally known even. And he, I'm gonna interview him on Friday. Unfortunately, we couldn't do it live, so it is a, it is a video. But he has, he has the only other uh, re, uh, demonstration uh, yard, basically. But his puts ours to shame. His is 12 acres. And he works with Shasta County uh, College or uh, Shasta Community College. And he's an instructor there. And he's got some great videos he's going to share. I learned a lot from him. And I think you will too. That's on Friday. You won't want to miss it. Of course, if you miss any of the classes when it first airs, give us about 24 hours. And today's classes will be back online. So if you want to share them, they can go and see a recorded version of today's classes probably as early as tomorrow morning. Mm -hmm. So, again, thank you. Hopefully you can take advantage of some of the other free training. Have a good Stormwater Awareness Week, everybody. Thanks very much. Goodbye.